a call for unity. He's walking in circles. I know, but this is the show. <laughs> Hello, I'm Dr. Gloria Lattimore Peace, host and producer of OmniU Presents, the H3O Art of Life show. And I know you don't believe it. I know when you saw the title going in circles and then saw it featured Barbara A. Sizemore, you don't believe I really have Barbara A. Sizemore <laughs> in the studio, but I do. And I'm so happy I could pinch myself because I have loved Barbara Sizemore for the longest period of time. And I can tell you, Barbara, that you first came to my attention when black students walked out of Harrison High School on the west side and got arrested for demanding a quality education. And there was a big rally and a lot of people, including a lot of teachers, came to that rally and you fired up that crowd and fired me up and I asked about you and found out that you were at Northeastern Illinois University, uh, a member of the faculty teaching courses in their master's program. I went right over and signed up. Before that, I had no intention of studying for a master's degree because I had a bachelor's degree and I had a good job working for the Chicago Board of Education or so I thought. But then I realized, but I had realized it for before that, but I realized that I could do something about it. I had realized that I didn't know how to teach or what to teach black children. That I had a bachelor's degree and I had some methods courses and I had some very good grades but I felt that having children who started out in September unable to read or to spell or to do whatever the curriculum called for and who could, not, could still not do that in June meant that they were not being taught. And I knew that there was something more that I needed to know. And when I saw you, I thought you knew what the answer was. So I came right over and I got in your methods class. And the first day of class, you got up and rolled off a whole bunch of research. S was it Sadowski and Lesser? I've forgotten who the researchers were. You talked about stigmatizing people and what a toll that took on their, not only their self-esteem, but just on their whole identity and so forth and so on. And I just sat there and took notes and I knew that you were a role model that I would be following, and I'm glad I did. Well, thank you. So thank I just had to much. pay that tribute to you. you. Now you thank tell people how you came to be walking in circles, because that's the name of the book that you've written, and we're going to be able to read it soon. So what makes you think you've been walking in circles? Because I've been trailing you. <laughs> so if you've been walking in circles, I've been going in circles. Well, the book is in uh, six chapters. Uh, I have to say that Haki Marabudi has been harassing me to write this book for quite some time. And I'm a procrastinator. People don't believe that, but I am. I put things off until the last minute. Uh, I get them done, but I put them off. And I think that um, I've been putting this book off for so long. I, I, Hockey reminded me. It's been something like 15 years. Mm. He's been trying to get me to write this book. Um, at, at least since I left Chicago, which was, which um, was, what's well, been a long time, 72. What's that? 31 years. But the book, uh, the coming of the book happened after I was in Pittsburgh for about 15 years. So, 15 years is about the right time. And Hockey kept saying, Barbara, you got to write this book. You've got to put these things down. You have to give people recommendations, and I couldn't get it done. I just was always into something, you know. This would come along and I'd jump into this, and this would come along and I'd jump into that. And I was so busy being an activist that I couldn't write. So it took God to give me cancer <laughs> to make me s sit down and do this work. Uh, so after uh, they diagnosed me with this cancer and they told me that my prognosis was that I'd have six months to a year to live, I said, oh my God, I gotta get busy and get this thing done. <laughs> so I finally finished the book and it's with the editor now and I'm, I'm sure she will make some kind of recommendations and I will have to do some rewriting, but I, I'm sure this is gonna get done. Then there's some techni 
technical things I have to do. I have to uh, um, get the appendix done. I have to do the index, the bibliography, you know, things like that. But but that's, they tell me there's software now to do it, so it shouldn't be a difficult job. But it has six chapters, and the first chapter is um, called uh, The Roots of My Biases. Um, when social scientists write books, they never tell people what their biases are, you know, but everybody has them. And most social scientists want you to believe that their science is objective, which rarely is, because the questions that you ask, even the, the research pursuits, come out of your experience and your education and through the prism that you look through to interpret life. So this is certainly subjective. So the best you can do is just tell your people right off, your readers right off, look, these are my, my biases. Here they are. Now I'm going to do my best to control them in the research. But <laughs> here's who I am, and this is how I got that way. So the first chapter is called The Roots of My Biases, and it's autobiographical. It starts, you know, with my early life in Indiana. It talks about, I was born December 17, 1927, right in the middle of Jim Crow one, and two years before the Great Depression. So those twin factors sort of like shaped my, my life. For all practical purposes, Northern Indi I mean, Southern Indiana was like an extension of Northern Kentucky, uh, which was a slave state. So we had segregation, we had, uh, uh, you couldn't eat at the restaurants, you, you know, all of that, uh, all that. We didn't have white fountains and black fountains because I guess the city was too poor for that. But you had to go sit in the colored section of the show and you couldn't eat, you couldn't try on clothes in some stores and that kind of thing. And the schools were all segregated, except for high school. And it's probably because it was a small town, didn't have enough money to build <laughs> another high school for black kids. So. When you, you were in elementary school, K through eight, it was segregated. Then you went to high school, it was integrated. Um, around um, about that time, I had all of these wonderful experiences in this segregated elementary school. Um, but I, I'm, not, I'm not praising segregation. I'm not saying I wanna go back to those days. I'm just saying for me, my segregated education was probably the best education that I had. Because back then, when I was in elementary school, I, I graduated from elementary school in 1940. So the eight years back to that time, my teachers were victims of the same segregation. And so they saw in us themselves, and we were like extensions of them. I can very well remember my eighth grade teacher, Marguerite Taylor, saying to me whenever I made poor grades on the test, how could you do this to me? It was as though I'd slapped her face or done something to her, you know, and I'm sitting there saying, what do you mean what I do to you? She said, how could you do this to me? You know, I'm not going to send you off to this integrated school, the white schools, they called them then, the white schools uh, doing this kind of work. And she would keep you after school and make you do these things. The other thing about living in a segregated community was that your teachers lived right there with you. So <laughs> they would come by your, by your house on the way home and drop in and tell your parents what you've been doing in school today. And they were my mother's friends. Uh, so, you know, it was very hard to misbehave in school given that kind of intimate contact between your parents and teachers. So that was another thing that was peculiar about these, these segregated schools. So when I went to integrated school, my teachers had already prepared me. Marguerite Taylor had taught us algebra in eighth grade. So when I went to algebra at Sarah Scott Junior High School, I was like one of the best students in the class. It was, but my mother still had to fight for me to go to the higher classes. They put me in 9B3. My mother went up there and says that she's coming home with all A's. She does homework in 10 minutes. She says, this is not challenging. I want her to be in 9A1. Well, they wouldn't put me in 9A1, but they put me in 9B1, but they put me in 9B2, um, which I was praying to God that my mother wouldn't move me out of there because the work was still easy and I could still get it done. You know, it was a little bit more challenging, but not too much. So I said, oh, God, please don't let mama get me in 9B1 nine, because nine I won't have time to do anything but study, you know. So fortunately, the, the discrimination against the African-Americans, we were called Negroes then, was so great, they wouldn't put me in 9B1, nine, nine which was cool with me. 
Uh, but then when I got to high school, it was a different kind of thing over there. Um, my mother and father had both been good students in high school. My father had been a Wabash Valley champion on the football team, and so had his, along with his brother, Herbert. And so they were held in high esteem, and they were always good students. So when I came along, I remember my senior English teacher, Grace Arnold, saying to me, what is your name? And I said, Barbara Ann Lafoon. And she said, who is your father, Herbert or Sylvester? I said, Sylvester. And she said, and who is your mother? I said, Delilah Mae Alexander. And she said, oh, Miss Lafoon, you can make two grades in here, A or F. And I was like, what? Uh, and then she went on to the next student. But she'd been there. I mean, this woman was two years older than Jesus. She'd been there forever. You know, like, and she just had one of these still memories. And she just remembered everybody. And um, so she held me to high standards, even though I was a Negro. So those kind of experiences that I had all, all tended to make me believe there really wasn't anything wrong with African Americans, that we could learn as well as better than white people, given the right educational conditions and the right people, mentoring and, mo and teaching, mentoring, and monitoring your progress. So from the very beginning, I never fell for this thing that, you know, there was an achievement gap that's permanent or can't be fixed or whatever. And then I moved to Evanston Township High School and had a whole different look at life. Uh, when my mother, my father was killed by a white policeman in, uh, when I was, um, let's see, this is 1935, so how old was I? I was eight. I was, was 10 days before my eighth birthday. And he thought that he was, he, he, he was, after, he was trying to arrest him for non-payment of child support, because he and my mother had divorced in 34. And my father was running uh, into this building, and he thought he was running away from him, and so he shot him and, uh, and, and killed him. Well, my mother always blamed herself for this, you know, naturally, and was a long time, was a long, 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 long time uh, d dealing with it. Um, so, so when that happened, uh, too, I, I lived with my grandmother and my mother until I was 12, and then my mother remarried and moved to Evanston. So in 1943, I came to live with my mother and my stepfather in Evanston, Illinois. No, I went to Evanston Township High School. Evanston Township High School in this inter was an integrated high school in an integrated community. It was the most racist high school that I had been to. I only been to one, mm -hmm. and it was racist. My English and my history teacher did the best that they could to turn me into their image of a black student, you know poor student, bad grades, whatever. And of course, by that time, I was in 12th grade then, it was too late for that. But uh, my English teacher, Mildred Hudson, who was my senior English teacher, would give me things that were so much harder than the other students, it was very apparent to me and to my mother. And, but my mother always wanted me to have challenges at work, so it didn't, it didn't bother her too much. Um, but things like this, for instance, the. the one member of the class would have On His Blindness by John Milton, you know, which is a, a sonnet, a 14-line sonnet, which is kind of like easy to remember because you have the A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A, C, D, E, C, D, E. So, you know, it's a clue there. There's the, so when you're going to memorize it, you have clues. She gave me the first 22 lines of the Canterbury Tales in Old English. <laughs> My problems in democracy teacher, Ethel Rogers, she was so determined that I wouldn't get the Women's Civic Club, Club Award that she gave not one one in her class. One was the highest grade you could get at the Evanston Township. They graded you one, two, three, four, five, and then W. She was so determined that I wouldn't get this prize that she didn't give anybody a one in that class just so she could keep from giving me one. <laughs> um, Evanston Township High School was the most racist high school I'd ever been in. Of course, uh, I've only been to two, as I said. But at any rate, I went on from there to Northwestern University, and that was an interesting thing, because my mother at that time was doing domestic work for a dentist who happened to be the chairperson of the alumni association at that time. So my mother asked him to help me get a scholarship to Northwestern, because 
my mother was too poor to, I mean, she was working, but she didn't have enough money to pay Northwestern's kind of tuition. And so he said she, he would be delighted to do that. And he said, what is her best subject? So my mother said Latin. And he was like, what? But at any rate, he, um, he, he, got, he, gave, he, he gave me an opportunity to take the classical language test. And I was the highest scorer. And so I got the scholarship and I went to Northwestern. Northwestern was a bastion of racism. I mean, black people couldn't even live on campus. Uh, Franklin Bliss Snyder, who was the president at that time, told my mother that black people didn't pay enough tuition at Northwestern to keep the lawns mowed. <laughs> uh, when we protested um, racial inequality on the campus, he called our parents to come and get us out of the picket line and said that every single one of us would lose our scholarships if we continued this. Um, it, was, it was terrible. I, I was so unhappy. And of course, there were no men. You know, the men were away at World War II. Um, I was so unhappy at Northwestern during my tenure there. I graduated in 47 um, that I didn't even go to my own graduation. It, it, was, it was the worst experience in my whole life. Added to that, Northwestern didn't teach me how to teach black kids. So when I was, um, um, when I started teaching Chicago Public Schools in 1947, I could, well, I couldn't get a permanent assignment because you had to graduate from Chicago Teachers College. And I had not done that. I had graduated from Northwestern, so I was not eligible for a permanent assignment. So I was sent as a substitute to John D. Shoup School at 1460 West 112th Street. And Ella Mae Cunningham Ham taught me how to teach school. I'm telling you, Gloria, when I went in that school, I had the slightest idea what you did. I couldn't even keep the kids in the, class, in the seats. I had a second grade with about 44 kids in it, because you know, 48 was the limit then. And I had about 44 kids. And I, could, I didn't know what to do to keep them in the seats. You know, the uh, ordinary classroom management things that you're supposed to learn. Huh? I, I didn't have any of that. And Ella Mae Cunningham, came to my room and she said to me, she said, do you want to be a school teacher? And I said, yes. And she said, well, first thing you got to do is keep them in their seats. And I said, I know that, but I don't know how. <laughs> <laughs> so she took me on her wing and taught me how to do classroom management. She said, you've got to be prepared. You have to be prepared. She said, they're not in their seats because you are not prepared. You have to be prepared. She said, so tomorrow when you come back, I want you to know what you're going to do. I want you to know what they're going to do. And I want you to have the activities all laid out for me. I had slice slightest idea what she was talking about. I know she must have thought, what in the world do I have in my hands here? Here is an honor student from Northwestern University has a slice school. What to do? So she taught me how to make little folders for him, how to put a little work in it and all that kind of thing. Ella Mae Cunningham. I would not be where I am today if it were not for Ella Mae Cunningham. She taught me how to teach school. And, you know, I just got better and better at it because I was determined. I'm kind of, kind of like a competitive person. I always want to be the best, you know. So I got better and better. I can truly say that she taught me how to teach anybody how to read. I mean, anybody. I have taught people how to read who were lost in opportunity rooms, who were in, that's what, we used to call them when the kids came up from Mississippi in the South and hadn't spent any time in school and couldn't read. I, sh I taught educationally, mentally handicapped, both in, in elementary school and in high school. I, I can literally say she taught me how to teach anybody how to read. And what we're doing now is so wrong for African-American children. African-American children have to have certain things in order to learn how to read. We speak uh, what um, my good friend Safisha Marabuti calls the African American English vernacular. Some people call it Ebonics. That's what we speak. It is not the same as standard English. When you read and you have to comprehend, you have to read in standard English. At some time in the lives of our children, somebody has to teach them standard English grammar. They're not going to learn it through osmosis. They're not earthworms. You have to teach it to them. So vocabulary and English grammar are two givens if you want to have comprehension. And then you have to teach them 
how, how, you have to teach them how to derive meaning from these. But if you don't know what a sentence is, then you can't understand a paragraph. And if you don't understand the paragraph, you can't comprehend the story. And this is a real challenge for our children. The other is vocabulary. They have to learn the vocabulary. So first the word, normal, the word, then how the word is formed in sentences and paragraphs, and then comprehending through what we, what we uh, call the taxonomy, you, you know, the old taxonomy. That's, that's what they need. They have to have this. And wherever you find teachers doing this, you find African-American children learning how to read rather quickly. Um, but unfortunately, the research that is done on reading is done with either integrated groups or white middle class children, because those are the children who live near the university. And university professors don't want to get too far away from the university. So their sample populations are always mixed. People bring me research all the time, and they say, this is what you should be doing for African American kids. And I read it, and maybe there are four or five African Americans in the sample. I mean, what are you supposed to do with that? And they're in an uh, integrated situation. I want to see research that's done in a 100% African-American school located in the low-income census zones may be characterized by crime and violence, because that's where my problems are. And if you don't do research in that milieu, then I don't have any confidence in what you're doing, because that's where I have to find out, does it work? So I'm, I'm um, a little bit concerned about the No Child Left Behind legislation, which requires that whatever you do in order to get funds must be research-based because there's so little research done in predominantly African-American schools located in low-income census zones characterized by, crime, characterized by crime and violence. So that worries me a little bit. But at any rate, this first chapter talks about my history with this. It takes me, it takes me through my education. It takes me through the education of my children my daughter graduated from Everson Township High School in 66, her son in 88, her daughter in 90. The same old problems we had when I graduated in 44 are still there, walking in a circle, mm -hmm. walking in a circle. The same things I fought, she fought. The, I mean, it's, it's uncanny mm -hmm. how little progress that we have made in solving the problems of educating African American children. We just will not will not speak to their needs. We just will not. And so they rebel. They rebel. They understand fully what's going on in the school. They're not fools and they're not crazy. And therefore, when they see these inequities, when they see this imbalance, when they see that what they're being given doesn't help them, then they go on and form their own little norms and their own little peer groups and their own means of rejuvenating their spirits and keeping themselves alive because we will not respond to their needs. And I see this over and over and over. I talk to my nephews, I talk to my stepchildren, I have four stepchildren, and I'm pleased with my children. My children have all exceeded my, my expectations. My two biological children both have their terminal degrees, they're both doctorates. My four stepchildren have all graduated from, from um, college. My two grandchildren who are old enough have already graduated from college. So my children have exceeded my expectations. None of them, and grandchildren, haven't. So that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about what happened to them, what happened to them in school, even though they were successful. Look, if my children and stepchildren and grandchildren could do the work, could read, could make good grades, and still got whipped, then what's happening to our other children? Mm -hmm. If my children, with an educated mother, with an educated mother, PhD, with experience in teaching, if my children can be in trouble in school learning, and they weren't discipline problems, but you know, learning, then, then what about all these other children? I had to practically be at school all the time to get my children what they needed. And my daughter, the same thing with her children. Why is that? Why is that necessary? Now, now, my premise is this. My premise is that the real problem is white supremacy. 
It's like two sides of this coin. One side is white supremacy. The other side is the imputation of black inferiority. See, if you, if you don't have somebody who's inferior, then you, you know, what's the good? In, You're not going to be superior to anything. So, so white supremacy, black inferiority, they go together. The two sides of the same coin, which is called racism, right? And this is what is the problem. Now, Thurgood Marshall tried to, to get to this. But how was he going to attack white supremacy when there's nine white justices on the Supreme Court? And he wanted to win his case. So he didn't attack white supremacy or white superiority. He attacked segregation. Segregation is only a symptom. Why would you segregate somebody if you didn't think they were inferior or nasty or dirty or something's wrong with them? Why would you do that? So when when Plessy versus Ferguson became the law of the land in 1896, and Brown wrote this decision that said, if there is a feeling of inferiority attached to separate but equal, it is in the eye of the Negro. He was lying, no question about it. Because the Negro didn't feel he was inferior, it was the white man who thought he was inferior. And he just turned it around and wrote a lie and then Plessy became the law of the land. Understanding this, Thurgood Marshall then knew, hey, if a Supreme Court justice would tell a big lie like that, he didn't have a fat chance in hell of, of solving this problem through the attacking the white supremacy. So Thurgood Marshall did the best he could. People are complaining about it now, you know, and say, but hindsight is always 20-20. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, <clears throat> When the decision came out in 1954, I remember writing a piece on it and saying, I will never say that um, anything that's all black is all bad, because my family's all black and it's good. My church is all black and it's good. I said, my school I went to in my early years of my life was all black and it was good. I said, so I'm not going to buy into that, which is really what the decision said, when the decision said that the separation of the Negro makes them feel inferior. That meant that if you separate into something all black, you got to feel bad about it. I didn't never feel bad about it. And then when I went to the 72 conference in 1972, and I heard uh, these people from these black colleges stand up and, and say these things, I'm saying, you're talking the black college right out of existence, because if it's all black, it's all bad. I never could bring myself to that, which took me to Forestville High School where I was principal. At that time, um, you know, the integration movement was all in big swing, and, and um, Martin Luther King had moved to Chicago. And of course, I knew Jesse very well. And, Je and I stood on the side of the folks in the Grand Boulevard community who wanted the high school built in the community. But Jesse and Al Raby and them wanted the high school built somewhere in Grand Park so it could be integrated. So we, you know, we hit heads there. And, um, but I won. King was, King was built. But this is a sorry story about King. And then, you know, I hope I can say this without crying. Um, when when um, Benjamin Willis made me principal of Forestville High School, it was a grow year high school in the old Dunbar building. You know, it didn't, wasn't adequately, it wasn't an adequate facility for a high school. So we always knew we were going to get a new high school. So when I won this battle about having a high school in the community with the, with the community people, I didn't win it by myself. I had all, all these community people. Um, when this happened, I asked Benjamin Willis if the teachers and I could plan this high school. I really thought I was <laughs> smart enough to build a foolproof high school. I really did. <laughs> so. I got these architects and I told them what I wanted. I told them I wanted a high school. I was going to build the premier performing arts high school in the city of Chicago. And I told them I want all the high school built around the stage. And I want the, everything that you do in the business for performing arts, I want it in this high school. I want them to have the business courses so that they could manage their own careers. And I wanted them to know how to make sets and costumes. And I wanted them to know how to do the lighting. And I just, everything that goes with this business, I want 
in this high school. And so they built the high school around the stage, put all the shops and, and business classes and things around the stage. I built up me an Olympic size swimming pool. I, had a, I just had everything in this high school. It was the most beautiful high school you ever wanted to see. And when we walked in there, when I, I, left, I left before the high school was built and went to University of Chicago to work on my doctorate, but I felt secure that I had built a foolproof high school. There's no way in the world that they can Lo and behold, the high school has been prostituted this whole, whole time it's been open, since 1970, it's been prostituted. It has never been a performing arts high school. In fact, the city built Curie, so it wouldn't be. And I'm, when I came back, I was gone from 72 to 92. I was gone for 20 years because I just couldn't work for James Moffitt. And um, I tried to, to get moved. You know, I wrote a lot of letters uh, to Manfred Bird, who was the deputy superintendent at the time, but I could never get moved, so I just quit and went to Washington, D.C. So I was gone for 20 years, and a lot of things happened in the time that I was gone. You know, Harold Washington was elected mayor and all of those good things, but nothing good happened for Martin Luther King High School. So when I came back, one of the things that I wanted to do was to restore Martin Luther High School to his dreams, okay? Okay, Paul Vallis uh, said he would, he would help me do this, okay? So we had a lot of meetings uh, about this high school. And um, they appointed Carl Lawson as the principal. And this was, I thought, just the best, just the best, best thing they could do. Because here was a man who had been the principal of Florence Price. You remember Florence Price, the great black pianist, mm -hmm. the music, musician, and, and educator. The school was named after her. Okay, so he had already a musical program in there, you know, and I was just thinking how wonderful that would be a Florence Price and then come on to Martin Luther King, you know. Anyway, they made him the principal, but he got absolutely no support. And the funny thing about it, Gloria, is I kept asking Paul, who is against this high school? You know, who is it that's against this high school? And for some reason, he, he could never say. You know, and Dr. Cosette Buckney told me one day, she said, well, there are a lot of people who are saying they don't want to sing and dance in high school at Martin Luther King, that they're building all these magnet high schools like Walter Payton and everything, and that's what they want. And I said, well, that, that doesn't exclude. I having a performing arts high school doesn't exclude. I said, they got them everywhere, New York City, Boston, they've got all of these. I said, my godchild graduated from uh, the New York High School of Performing Arts, and she's a, Penn, a Philadelphia lawyer now. I said, what, who said that it has, it can't, but I could never identify. I went to Alderman Tony Preckwinkle, you know, because I thought maybe it was coming from political end. The Alderman said, look, Barbara, she says, I don't care what kind of high school's over there, I just want a good high school. So I could never find the opposition. I could never find the opposition to that high school, but that high school, it, it never came into fruition. So, Paul changed his mind and he said, well, I'm, I'm going to make a regional magnet out of the high school. And so I said, well, can I have a performing arts strand in the high school? And he said, well, that might be possible. So I fought for that. And uh, when Arnie Duncan came in, he, he uh, approved of it. And so that's what we're trying to do. And they have a very good principal there, Linda Coles. And so that's, that's you know, what we're trying to work for. So since I've, I've been home, you know, I've been working with the schools until, you know, recently. The second chapter is about um, Pittsburgh. Um, I spent 15 years at the University of Pittsburgh, and that's where I began my study of effective African-American schools, public schools, public schools. Because we've always had exceptional African-American private schools. And Asa, here you can talk to your Mesoca and Haki and, uh, and Sophia by the private schools. But there are not enough of them to serve all of our children. Our children are predominantly in public schools, although the charter school movement, I think, gives us a chance to, to do more, although we haven't done it. But my concern is with all of our children in public schools. So when I went to Pittsburgh, I found three high-achieving, predominantly African-American elementary schools located in low-income census zones. The Van School had 91% of its students at or above the norm in reading 
on the Iowa Test of Basic Skills in, uh, this was what, 1979-1980 school year and had been high achieving school since 1968. And it served all of the children in the biggest project in Pittsburgh, Bedford. And I'm saying, wow. So I got a grant to study these three schools, Belts, Hoover, Van, and Madison. And I published that study, I guess, in 1983. Then I went back in. Madison was the lowest achieving of these three schools. They got a new principal, and that principal went to another school. And the school then surpassed Van in 1985 when I went back in the school. This was the highest achieving school in the city of Pittsburgh, elementary school, in the city of Pittsburgh in 1985. Um, and then this principal who left Madison went to Westwood, and it became a high achieving school. So I'm saying, wow, this is, this is something. So then I started looking for these high achieving schools, and I found three in Dallas. That's as far as I got. And I found a high school in Dallas uh, where Napoleon Lewis uh, had elevated achievement in Lincoln High School. And Lincoln was in the U.S. News and, and World Report. It was in Red Book as a, a high achieving African. It was located in southwest Dallas, right in the middle of drug infested neighborhoods and everything. And it was a neighborhood school. So we have all of this evidence now, just like um, uh, Ron Edmonds said. We know everything we need to know to educate our children. The question is, why aren't we doing that? Why aren't we doing that? Why aren't we doing that? It's a good question. Walking in circles, OK? okay. Walking in circles. So what happened in Pittsburgh? These schools, when the principals all left, retired, schools went right back down. Now they're right back where they were. And it's taken them, what, since 1968? to what, 2003, to do that to Van, but now we're back again. You understand what I'm saying, walking in circles? We're walking in circles because the commitment is to white supremacy. The commitment is to white supremacy, and you must, you must preserve the imputation of black inferiority in order to have it. If you eliminate the imputation of black inferiority, what happens to white supremacy? It collapses. It collapses. It collapses. And so I'm convinced that's why we're walking in circles, because we will not attack white supremacy, and that's what we have to do. I don't care how painful it is, I don't care how hurtful it is, I don't care what the cost, if we never do it, it will never happen. I'm talking about now for the masses of our people. I'm not talking about those who escape, like you and me and Oprah and the three men who are the CEOs. I'm not talking about us. I'm talking about the 70% of our people who are below that line. That's what I'm talking about. These people for whom racism is the nemesis that keeps them from being what they can be. That's, those are the people I'm talking about. And un unless, as um, W.E.B. Du Bois talked about the talented 10th, mm -hmm. unless this talented 10th mobilizes itself so that it operates in a capacity where it can lift up the bottom, then we're going to be walking in circles. We're just going to be walking in circles. That's, that's what's going to happen. Then I went from Pittsburgh came back home. I came home in 92 as dean of the School of Education at DePaul. The Vincentians there who run that university, the Congregation of the Mission, have a very large service requirement for everybody who works, which was, which was wonderful for me. Mm -hmm. In fact, it was the first institution that I worked for that did not penalize me for helping the poor. Because every minute I was in Chicago Public Schools, I had to fight everybody to help the poor. I had to fight everybody, my superiors, everybody, everybody. Uh, when you first met me, um, you, um, fighting for those kids, that, those, those high school those students, yes, I thought I was, if it wasn't for Warren Bacon, I would, would have lost my job. But it was uh, Bobby Wright and I went, Bobby Wright and I went to the Board of Education to talk to the Board of Education. And we had two friends there. You'd be surprised who the second one was. Warren Bacon and Mrs. Green, Mrs. Wendell Green. Mm, interesting. Mm -hmm. um, the chairperson of the, oh, what was her name? The chairperson of the uh, Urban League. What was her name? I don't know. Oh, God. That's the only thing I hate about aging. You forget things that you know. You know, I don't like that. But anyway, she was the president of the board, so she was like, uh, you know, in the middle, kind of in the middle. But mm -hmm. I th I'm sure she was on our side. Mm -hmm. But she was, she wasn't as outspoken about it. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so we had support uh, for that. 
And of course, Bobby was not in the school system, you know, mm -hmm. but I was, mm -hmm. and I was on leave and trying to, and, and had to come back. Uh, so I was in a, you know, continuous position there. But somebody had to stand up for these kids. Mm -hmm. That was very clear to me. And so I had to walk into the vacuum and take my place. And that's when you met me. And of course, Warren Bacon saved me from getting fired. And Mrs. Green and uh, Preston, Carrie, Carrie B. Preston was Okay, her name. all right. Carrie yes. B. Preston. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we had support. Uh, but any, at any rate, when I came back to Chicago in 1992, um, they had the service requirement. And I liked that because it gave me, oh, oh, two, the Vincentians are priests who have committed themselves to poverty. Mm -hmm. um, they evangel their mission is to evangelize the poor and to alleviate their misery. Mm -hmm. So so every time I would come up with, you know, suggestions about what to do for poor, they were, they were always a receptive audience. Mm -hmm. so, so we set up the school achievement structure in order to help uh, these poor schools, the poor schools. We only worked in the lowest achieving schools, and most of them were predominantly African American. And we got a chance to go in and try to help these schools. Okay, here's, this is the problem. Our schools do not have the resources necessary to meet the needs of African American children. Look, Dr. Peace, if you have a school with 1,200 kids in it, and 90% of your kids come from low income families headed by one one parent who, who's trying to stay out of poverty, therefore working sometimes two jobs. Uh, if you have, if you live in a neighborhood where there's drive-by shootings and gangs, and it's hard for you to get to school, so you know you miss school a lot of time because you don't want to get killed. And high school is wonderful, but it's not worth dying for. Um, if you have all these kinds of problems in community and family and everything. You cannot have the same formula for teachers and social workers and nurses as a school where everybody's got plenty of money mm -hmm. and two parents at home. Mm -hmm. It's Pleasant not going to work. Will. It's not going to work. Mm -hmm. Everybody's got to get the same ratio of teachers. It doesn't make any difference whether you've got a whole lot of money or whether you have none. Mm -hmm. Something's wrong with that. Mm -hmm. Something's wrong with that. Mm -hmm. So our schools, our schools that serve predominantly African-American children are not only that uh, underfunded for the needs, I'm talking about the needs the children have, mm -hmm. not only that, but they suffer other kind of things that are not allowed for. For instance, if you live in a high crime neighborhood, you can bet your school's gonna get broken into. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can believe that's gonna happen mm -hmm. unless you've got a guard there for 24 hours to mm -hmm. guard your, your stuff. So when you lose all of your computers because somebody broke in your school and took them, are they replaced? Mm -hmm. Uh-uh, mm -hmm. you just sit there without computers. Mm -hmm. Something's wrong with that. And the, and the rules do not allow you to have extra funds for safes, you know, to build for mm -hmm. that, or for a guard, or for anything like that, or to replace your stuff because mm -hmm. it's not insured. So, you know, our schools are treated as though they are in safe areas where the policemen are taking care of everything, mm -hmm. and, and that kind of thing doesn't work. Last thing, here recently, because of the magnet schools and the test-in programs where you have to take a test to go to school, mm -hmm. uh, like King is now. King is no longer a people's school like I had envisioned it. Mm -hmm. It's a school now where you have to take a test to get in. Mm -hmm. So the kids who benefit from the performing arts program are not the kids that I had planned for, if you understand. Yes, they're the kids I planned for, but they're just a part of those kids, mm -hmm. you know, the ones who can pass the test. Mm -hmm. So now uh, we have two tiers of schools. We have two tiers, especially high schools. We have the, tier, the magnets, and then we have the general high schools. Mm -hmm. Now, what's happening is that the general high schools are getting all of the special ed kids. Mm -hmm. So I've got high schools with 30% Austin out there. It's got 42% special ed kids in it now, 42%. Mm -hmm. Do you think they get these special faculty for those kids? Oh, no. They're on the same faculty with school that has 8%. Mm -hmm. I think they got 1% at Northwest Special mm -hmm. Ed. Mm -hmm. And the kids that they select are the kids who can be isolated. You know, it's just so unfair. It's so grossly unfair. And yet, the same expectations are for these teachers to produce at these schools that are underfunded and under-resourced as for the, the people at the other schools. It's wrong. It's corrupt. 
It's raw. And it's leave no raw. child behind doesn't mean that the children who are not excelling in these schools can move to another school. We don't have the schools. And there are rooms. Because you can't there. get in the test in schools. Mm -hmm. You have to test in those schools. Mm -hmm. So they're like protected. Mm -hmm. You understand? Mm -hmm. But the general school has to take anybody knocks on the door. Mm -hmm. And since the special ed kids can't go to the test in schools, then they all aggregate in, in the schools that are already low achieving, understaffed, and underfunded. underfunded. Mm -hmm. You have teachers in the special ed classes who are business administration people. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have the slightest clue how you deal with these kids. They plan to put more such people in the public schools. <laughs> people who are changing careers. Yes. Who right. never intended to teach, know right. nothing about teaching. Absolutely. And will get so no training. So when I came back, that's what, so I went to Paul Vallis and I said to Paul, you've got to do something about, and Sue Gam, um, who's the head of special ed, you have to do something about the disparity. So Paul said he would, and this is the way he, he sent out the bulletin. The bulletin was that every school was to take special ed children uh, to, to try to reach the average. I think the average at that time was 15%. It's higher now. But at that time, I was having my discussions with Paul Vallis. It was like 15%. So his idea was that every school would be at or near 15%. Um, my friend, my very dear friend, Dr. Hazel Stewart, was the Region 3 um, uh, officer, educational officer. And I know that she struggled to make that happen in her school. But the, the, way, the reason it was defeated was that the testing schools opted to take the children who were isolated. See, Corey versus Board says you have to mainstream these kids, okay? You have to provide a special education for them, but in the least restrictive environment, mm -hmm. all right? Which means then that they have to mix in the regular classes, mm -hmm. okay? Now, the idea is, though, that you have a special ed teacher to work with the regular teacher. Mm -hmm. That never happened. Mm -hmm. And I kept telling Paul that never happened. So he said, well, we're going to train more special ed teachers. And I have to give him credit. He did work on it. But then, you know, Mayor Daly fired him before um, he could really get this completed. Now, it seems like it's uh, just fallen under the table. It doesn't seem like anybody's doing any work on them. Because anytime you get Austin at 42%, they're not working on the problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I have high schools where, uh, you know, the teachers just, they're just not certified to teach special ed. So nothing's happened. Now, Let's look at the high stakes testing. This high stakes testing is um, greatly affected by this because if you, if you put special ed kids into a regular classroom for the least restrictive environment, but you have no special ed teacher in there assisting the regular teacher, regular teacher doesn't know what to do with those kids. Mm -hmm. So those kids obstruct the learning for everybody else in the class. Mm -hmm. That means the scores go down. Mm -hmm. Um, I sat in this class with a really good teacher. She was a first year teacher. I mean, and for a first year teacher, she was a good teacher. She was trying to do all of the things that they told her to do in this class. But she had two EBD4s in there. What's an EBD4? Uh, uh, educable, uh, um, behaviorally disordered, emotion emotionally and behaviorally disordered oh my. at the fourth level. Okay. And um, when I read their uh, IEPs, you know, the individual mm -hmm. educational plans, um, both of them have been recommended for um, a therapeutic community. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. One of them had been recommended for therapeutic community, and the other one had, the IEP said that he should have a 24-hour day com person with him. All, every, wherever he goes in school, he should have somebody with him. Mm -hmm. All right. Neither one of them had that. So this teacher, I sat in there with her for several weeks. This teacher never knew when she was going to be able to teach a class. Mm -hmm. She never knew because she didn't know what they were going to do. Mm -hmm. They were totally unpredictable. Just totally unpredictable because that's what emotionally and behavioral disorders people do. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, she, she quit. After the year was over, she went someplace else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So those are the kinds of things that exist in the schools that nobody talks about. And um, uh, for some reason now, this, this particular administration is very secretive. It doesn't, 
tell you things till they're done. Mm -hmm. You know, then, then, um, you know, then, then that's what happens. So it's hard to make recommendations or to get into discussions because it's, it's secretive. And um, the problems that affect uh, African American kids are just not being worked on. Yeah, These eight not. schools that you're studying now, mm -hmm. the, the 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 study that you're writing. Well, this study is from ninety nineteen from the ninety six ninety seven school year through the ninety seven ninety eight school year. All right. That's the those are the years we're talking about with these schools. Um, other other uh, interesting things happened in these uh, black schools that um, that kind of like see one of the things about the research that trouble that's troublesome is that because these are minority schools, they are relegated to oblivion, is what I call it. Mm -hmm. Because everything in research is discussed by average, mm -hmm. whatever the average is, mm -hmm. or whatever the norm is. Mm -hmm. And so if your schools are below the norm or above the norm, uh, they're like not really important. Mm -hmm. Uh, let me give you an example. Every time you read the effective schools literature, these black schools that I described to you, like the, the three in Pittsburgh mm -hmm. and the three in Dallas, Texas, mm -hmm. they're called outliers. An outlier is an anomaly. You know, it, like this is the exception that proves mm -hmm. the rule. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, well, they're, that's not what they, they, they're the exceptions that disprove the rule. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. so they tell you, they say, well, they're just outliers. They don't count. Like, for instance, if you, ha if you have, let's say you're using average, and you have a kid over here who makes a score of 100. Mm -hmm. The rest of your kids are making scores like 75. Mm -hmm. Well, this 100 brings the average up, you mm -hmm. see, mm -hmm. so that it really obscures the fact that and most of the <laughs> children yeah, are making 75. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. OK, well. That's, that's what they say about the outliers. Mm -hmm. they, what they don't say is that the outliers could be models for teaching other people how to be like them. Mm -hmm. That's what's not said. Mm -hmm. And in every school system that I've studied, the people who know how to do this are not the people who are called on to be consultants, experts. Mm -hmm. They're not. Mm -hmm. The people who are called on to be experts and consultants are people in the universities who've never taught a black kid anything ever, and sometimes have never lived with black people or know any. Mm-hmm. So they are the least expert That's correct. in the field. That's correct. That's correct. In every city that I've studied, Pittsburgh, Dallas, Chicago, the people who know how to do this are not the people who are the experts and the consultants and whatever. Yes, it's interesting. And it's all a part of white supremacy and the imputation of black inferiority. It, it's all a part of that. Now, so um, from the Chicago, so the first chapter is the roots of my biases. The second chapter is um, Pittsburgh, because the roots of my biases takes me through Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And then I go to Pittsburgh. That's the second chapter. And then I go to Chicago. That's the third chapter. And then I... Um, talk about um, um, the school achievement structure, um, how we tried, to, this is the outreach program that, that um, oh, excuse me, I'm, I've left the second chapter out, I'm sorry. The first chapter is the roots of my biases. Mm -hmm. The second chapter is in search of a paradigm to control my biases. Okay. okay. That's the effective schools model. Mm -hmm. The third is, is Pittsburgh. The fourth is Chicago. The fifth is a school achievement structure that we that was my outreach program at DePaul. It's still there. And then the sixth is the epilogue. Okay. Well, we're in five minutes. Can we talk about the epilogue? Well, in the epilogue, I talk about walking in circles, that we, we, we keep making the same mistakes over and over and over, and that what we need is to have a frontal attack against white supremacy. We've got to change the curriculum, which is devoted to white supremacy. We have to change the way we teach our children how to read. We've got to teach them standard English. We have to teach them vocabulary. We have to teach them their own cultural history. Our children don't know their cultural history. They don't even recognize white supremacy when they see it. 
I uh, was interested in your previous conversation with Nyambi. We need to be teaching these girls this in school, in health. We need to be teaching our boys in school about prisons and how you get there and how they treat you. Uh, there's just so much now available. This whole, uh, the last issue of the uh, Journal of Negro Education was devoted to the juvenile court process for African American youngsters. Our children do not understand how they're set up for this. And if you sometimes understand what's going on, it's helpful for you to make better choices. So these things that Nyambi's talking about for girls and these things for boys need to be taught in school, which was what Anderson Thompson was trying to do at Forestville High School way back in 1967 when we had four warring gangs there. And what he, he designed were the women of Forestville and the men of Forestville. And we had monthly assemblies with the women by themselves with the women teachers, the men by themselves with the men teachers, mm -hmm. trying to address the problems that our children faced outside of school and in the wider community. And this still needs to be done. So if we want to get stop walking around in a circle, we're going to have to take a frontal attack against white supremacy with educational means. And we can do this in schools that we don't control because, you know, we, we never did get to the community You're welcome. control. We control these schools. All right. The Tell only me thing about that it. keeps you from doing what the nobody walked. The whole time I was a teacher in all black schools, nobody ever walked in my classroom except Ella May Cunningham, and that was because she wanted to help me. So you I never saw a principal. So no, I knew who the principal was, but no principal ever came in my room said that to me. Now they do. Now they do. But I'm talking about when I was. Now you have an all-black school, an all -black, the students are all black, mm -hmm. principal's black, assistant principal's black, mm -hmm. right? You've got mixed teachers, mm -hmm. right? But there's nobody that comes in there and tells you, you know, you, you can't do this or you can't do that, mm -hmm. right? If, if you have research or, or evidence that what you're doing is working. Of course, now everybody's got to do the Chicago Reading Initiative, which eliminates, which doesn't include English grammar, so it's not going to work for high school kids. Um, and it won't be as effective for elementary school kids because that's necessary for our children to comprehend. It's a basic part of comprehension. But you could do this as a teacher if you wanted to do it. There wouldn't be anybody who would fire you. If you did the Chicago Reading Initiative and in addition you did English grammar, wouldn't anybody fire you or hurt you or, you know, do anything to you? Well, you know, they're, they're firing us off of television because our hour has gone by. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love that you are still full of you know what, oh, a yeah. whole bunch of spunk and a whole bunch of passion. And I tell you, you will go on forever because you believe in what you are doing. I do. And you do it. I do. You are doing it so well. I do. And I appreciate you so much, Barbara. I'm glad I got more. here. <laughs> I'm glad you got here too. So good. And look at that smile. Smile into that camera. Your eyes have just turned in the slit. You're smiling so broadly. Oh, I'm so glad you were able to come. Me too. Okay. Me too.